So today we want to talk about kids and because kids are going back to school and of course, you know, we're living in a time that's not um, exactly normal for any of us. So um, I know I was just going to start with some tips, um, but I think it might be helpful if Chris, you start off and just kind of talk about what you were going to speak about the immune system. I think that might be a good segue into it first. Great. Well, hello everybody, welcome. Thanks for coming today. And so we are gonna talk about the immune system and um, one, and then these guys are gonna help share uh, more light on it and um, kind of tips on how to do it. Cause I'm just gonna say what is helpful for the immune system, but not how to do it. So uh, one of the important things with the coronavirus happening right now is it's making us all more aware about uh, chronic illness and the importance of our immune health to protect us against infections, such upper respiratory infections such as COVID-19. And so what are a couple of things that I really want to focus on today and I, I really want kids to focus on are, one is fresh fruits and vegetables. So um, no matter how, what kids are used to eating, just starting to bring in fresh fruits and vegetables. So things like oranges and apples, um, berries, just having them easy stuff, they can choose what they want. Um, broccoli, carrots, tomatoes. So again, whatever's kid friendly and you guys will have to come up with that knowing your kids and your family and get ideas, but ideas like that. I, I like to have them picking colors of the rainbow so they get exposed to different things. One thing they like of each color. So again, so they feel like they have choices. They're not forced into a corner. Um, and so they can learn to like it. But the fresh produce is really important for a couple of reasons. The one important reason is it has vitamin C in it. And if kids are only eating everything cooked, vitamin C is very heat stable or heat labile. And so it loses it when you cook it. So just trying to get them to eat some fresh fruits and vegetables is really important to help support that immune system. Another thing that I like is remember that fiber. It's all about the microbiome right now. There's so much wonderful information coming about the microbiome and we've been talking a lot about that. So um, fiber from the fresh fruits and vegetables, fiber from legumes, if they'll eat any beans or peas or lentils or whatever they'll eat, uh, mixing that into different dishes. Uh, whole grains, so if they'll eat some oatmeal for us in the morning with some berries, right? You can, you can knock a couple of these out, uh, hopefully relatively easy, brown rice, wild rice, things like that, whole grain bread for, for sandwiches and wraps. So these are a few of the ideas. Um, but I, I'm really focusing right now fresh fruits and veggies for the uh, micronutrients and helping the immune system there. Um, and then focusing on the fiber. Another thing that I like to think about is either green leafy vegetables or cruciferous vegetables. So it depends on how old your kids are and maybe they're not eating anything and you don't wanna go here yet, but if they are starting to, to think about things that are even more immune supporting. So the cruciferous vegetables is gonna be like broccoli and cauliflower and cabbage family. And so maybe they'll eat a cabbage slaw with a fun dressing. Maybe they'll eat some broccoli lightly steamed. Um, so there's, you know, you can play with different things to try to get them to eat that. Um, if they will eat it again, if they're getting older, but I loved, I would love the idea of getting some mushrooms in kids. And if, if they're not to that level, then don't worry about that. Start with the fresh fruits and veggies, but mushrooms in general are really going to support the immune system. So anyway, you can sneak them in. If you're making a whole grain pizza crust and putting some red sauce on it and loading it with veggies, maybe some mushrooms would be a good thing to add on. So um, that's another important thing that I like to see in kids. And one more idea is um, onions and garlic are really strong immune supporters. So if they're going off to school and being exposed to all sorts of different infections, um, there used to be the day where people were wearing garlic or onion around their necks um, during like the plague uh, in Europe because it was preventing um, them from getting the, the virus. And so or the infection from the plague. And so, right, it's written about in different books. And so, but there is some truth to that, not wearing it, but actually eating it. So uh, if you can cook it into dishes maybe, or mix it into a salad dressing or add a little green onion, even the sweeter part to a salad for them or whatever, however old your kids are, whatever level they are with trying different fruit uh, vegetables, that's an idea. And then the last thing I wanna talk about is other things that are important for the immune system in addition to food, and that is getting sunshine so even as they're going off to school, they need the sunshine, they need the outdoor time. Um, if they're not getting sunshine or they live north of basically Colorado, 
um, they need probably maybe a little bit extra vitamin D. Vitamin D will help their immune system. So paying attention to where you live and your kid's status and how much outdoor time and sunshine. And sleep is vital to the immune system. So kids get stressed going back to school. They maybe worry about COVID-19 or stress or school or things going on right now in the world. And so uh, making sure they're getting sleep and really prioritizing, giving them enough hours to sleep to support their immune system. Um, stress management is important for kids just like it is for adults. So if they are worried with school, we see a lot of belly pains and things happening at the beginning of school years. So um, due to stress of school. So um, helping them through with things like that and giving them tools to work with stress. So um, those are my ideas for the immune system. And now let's hear more about it and how to do it. Cause that's not an easy, those aren't easy thoughts for kids sometimes. No, not at all. Dr. Clapper, any other thoughts on the immune system oh, sure. or suggestions? Absolutely, yes. Um, before we get into immune system stuff, um, I just want to touch all parents out there who are even contemplating raising their child on a plant-based diet. Um, it, it, if you're not familiar with the subject, it may seem like a scary thing. You know, you've got young sons, you want them to eat that red meat, and, uh, and uh, even women, uh, you know, girls need, uh, they need protein. And uh, uh, absolutely, uh, it, it, to be the to be the strange one uh, in class, is there's also social issues there. Uh, first of all, you, uh, no child is going to do this unless they're asking for it. If the child is asking to be a vegan or are you going on a plant-based diet, there's something wonderful is happening in that child's awareness uh, and that child's sense of self, uh, their, their connection with the world, their empathy is awakening. So many children, when they realize these little animals they love, is that 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 leg of lamb is a leg of a lamb and it, it shocks them. And that's a, it's a priceless, precious moment that you don't, don't injure them by, by disregarding the, the feelings behind it. And as for plant-based health professionals, we can tell you it is not, not only is it not a crazy thing to do, but the reality is to all parents raising their child as on a plant-based diet, you are giving your child a medical slash biological life gift beyond measure. This child will never develop clogged arteries. They will never develop diabetes. They will never be the fat kid in school. They are, uh, the, the girls are going to have much easier time going through puberty as will the guys. Their skin is probably not going to have acne. It's a gift beyond measure. And, and when they get in their 40s and 50s and all their friends have developing diabetes and dropping dead from heart attacks, their, their systems are going to be clean and clear. And, uh, and they're, they're just going to be more effective human beings that don't get entangled in, in the medical morass that, uh, that envelops so many of our young people nowadays. So not only is it not, not a bad thing to do, it, it is a, it's a wonderful gift to give and just keep remembering that. And plus that real pure place in your child where this desire is coming from, that should, you should sit down and explore that. You might even learn a thing or two about, about your own diet there and maybe a little change how you're saying some things. So uh, it's a reasonable thing to do. Uh, human beings have been growing up eating plant-based foods since the beginning of time. They're doing it around the world as we speak at this moment. It is not a crazy thing to do to serve your child the bean chili instead of the beef chili. It's, it's, a, it's a reasonable thing to do. Um, and so and, and that thread may uh, emerge again a few, in a few forms uh, during this discussion. I just wanted to set that as far as context goes. <clears throat> um, as far as the, uh, the immune system, what Dr. Miller says, absolutely right. Again, uh, we need these, especially these fresh live foods for lots of reasons, but yeah, I have no problem with steaming kale and uh, making soups, but, but raw vegetables, raw fruits, um, they, uh, you know, they're still connected to their natural state there and their, uh, their immune system are, are getting more interesting molecules, pectins, and uh, various types of plant fibers that have their own immune stimulating properties in and of themselves. Uh, but there's also, there's, there's microbes on the surface of these vegetables. They, they help educate the child's immune system. It's important for them, for all of us, to be eating raw produce. Raw fruits and vegetables are really important. And uh, as Dr. Miller was listening, listing her, uh, her uh, groups of all-star all immune uh, allies there, 
I'm sure somebody say, yeah, I get my kid to eat uh, eat an apple. You know, it isn't going to happen. Uh, just going to uh, call your attention to a very illustrative study that came out of uh, the, uh, I think it was the Journal of Nutritional Common Sense, uh, but it was, it was a real uh, study that uh, showed in, in the schools when they, it was, that it was mandated, you had to put a piece of fresh fruit on every child's tray. And as the child got to the end of the cafeteria line, the, the apples and the bananas would go in the garbage. They just weren't eating them. But if the folks back in the kitchen there took the apples and cut them up into, into bite-sized pieces and served a uh, little dish full of apple chunks or, or grapes that were already off the stem or banana slices, ooh, the kids took that and they ate them. And uh, so just the act of cutting up the fruit makes a huge difference uh, to people of younger age there. So, uh, so don't get too discouraged, use your imagination. And if a kid doesn't like strawberries this week, might next month, uh, who knows? And we'll be talking about, I'm sure there's ways to blend fruits and veggies into, into soups and salads and disguise them with applesauce. There's, there's ways to get, uh, get the veggies. And I'm sure Juliana, our dietitian, will have all sorts of good ideas. And, and <clears throat> Dr. Marbus, who's raised a couple of her own, probably has some good ideas as well. So, uh, so with that, I will defer to my female colleagues. But I just wanted to set, put uh, that, those comments out in way of context. So. I'll turn it over to Dr. Marvis. So every single time, Dr. Comfort, there's always something, it was either the flea's navel last time, but now <laughs> it's it's the Nutritional Journal of Common Sense. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh, there, there are some amazing tidbits and stuff there that you just said, and I will be stealing that phrase. So thank you. Um, I, I'm just kind of rounded out with some tips and then Juliana could tell us the food or whatever she'd like um, to share with us because she's also raised two. I've raised three. Um, they were teenagers when we switched over. So, of course, I made it really hard on myself, 13, 15, 18. Now they're uh, 26, 24, and almost 22. Um, all plant-based, believe it or not, um, actually helping me run Healthy Human Revolution, which is a place where we actually have a course actually on kids. So uh, the thing with kids, honestly, with any parenting is set the example. So it's really hard and unfair to a child to say, you're going to have to eat healthy, but mom and dad are going to, you know, snack on this. So some of the, the best examples, you know, I'm working with different families. Um, some, you know, a young one that may have type one diabetes that I, one of my families, the whole family goes on board. You know, I have a different one where uh, the, the daughter is a teenager comes to see me, but mom's on board, but dad's not. So that really makes it difficult because dad just brings junk into the house, but it makes it hard on the other two, or the other part of the family are to try to be healthy. So if you guys can get on board to set the example, because this really is like Dr. Clever said, the, the most important gift you can give your child is a healthy future, because then there's nothing else that they can't do. So everything you teach them when they're little, teenagers, it doesn't matter. That is so, so very crucial um, to their future. And nobody wants to get type two diabetes in their teens. And I've certainly seen it. I'm sure these guys as well. Um, but these are not genetic diseases. Your genetics may make you more prone to it, but it's your lifestyle that pulls that trigger. So, you know, just, I've had so many patients say, oh, well, they're genetics, you know, or I have genetics for diabetes in my family. It's like, no, you actually have, you know, what runs in your family is bad eating, poor eating habits. So just think about that, but you have to set the example. And that may be the other thing. And like Dr. Cloud said, make it fun. There are so many ways to make this fun. Get them in the kitchen. They really need to be preparing their own food with you because not only are they gonna be communal and building relationships, but these are skills that a lot of young people don't know. <laughs> they're, like, they're like, I don't even know how to boil water. I'm like, oh my goodness. You know, so I've had patients literally who had one pot and one spoon in their kitchen. And so, I mean, this is a travesty. It's like, how did y'all grow up? I mean, like I was cooking for the whole family when I was young because we all took turns and we helped each other. So, you know, get them in the kitchen, get them in the grocery store, you know, help them plan the menu, things that they want to eat, things that they like, go try a new food. We used to go, when I brought all this home, um, when they were teenagers, we'd go shopping together like we did before. But I said, pick out something that you guys want to try, you know, the dragon fruit. Well, we've never tried dragon fruit. All these different foods and veggies and some amazing things you could try, new recipes. And it actually became a lot of fun. And now I have three kids that can actually fend for themselves in the kitchen. And they actually make pretty good stuff. So I even use my youngest Gabe's tofu scramble recipe because it was so good. I'm like, why alter it? <laughs> so, you know, allow them to be experimenting and enjoy that process. And kitchen should be comfortable. 
and one with, you know, filled with nutrition and joy that comes out of the kitchen because that should be one of your favorite places to be. And, you know, one thing to do is instead of just saying, we're doing this overnight, like I did. <laughs> so there's some thoughts there. I probably should have introduced it slowly, but I don't tend to run that way. Um, but one food a week, you know, just kind of work on one food a week. And that might be enough. And when it comes to like, I don't want it, mom. Okay, that's fine. But you need to enforce the one bite rule. Honestly, even a lick will count. So if they can just get one little bite over time, hopefully that'll be incorporated into their palate. And the studies that I've read is like 15 to 18 different times. So, you know, just some thoughts there. Um, you definitely want to think about how to make the food valuable to them. So if you tell a five-year-old, eat your veggies, it makes you healthy. No, you say, eat your broccoli because it makes you smarter or eat your broccoli because it'll make you run faster than your friend, Timmy. You know, these are the things that are really important. Or eat your broccoli because it makes your brain grow so you can ace that test. Something to that degree. Um, also challenge them. Who doesn't like a challenge? If you can beat your brother or sister or something, game on. So, you know, let's, let's put a chart out and say, here's the colors of the rainbow. How many of you can get in a day? So, and honestly, if they can beat your parents, it's even better. It's like the day that my daughter could outrun my husband, we still gloat about it because she was 13. So, you know, these are things that kids love. So, I don't know, at least if you have the comparative spirit, there's usually something you can find to get kids motivated. Um, and honestly, there's a lot more I have, but those would be for time savings. But if you guys have any questions about kids or kid health, we would be happy to see kiddos too, plantbasedtelehealth.com. Um, and again, Juliana, please tell us how to feed these kids. I mean, you guys just said everything. <laughs> so much. <laughs> and all four, all three of your comments were amazing. And I, I screen check, I agree with everything. As the plant-based dietitian and as a mom, You'll be proud to know that my daughter's first word after mom was anthocyanin. <laughs> because right now it's oh my gosh. When I was oatmeal with her blueberries, I'd say anthocyanin, antioxidant. And it, I swear she said it. It was the coolest moment ever for me. Uh, I felt like that was a success. Um, that said, from a professional standpoint, I love working with families. And I think, like you said, Dr. Clapper, it is the best gift you can give your child is to teach them and inspire them and show them how to do this and why, or just at least hint at why, and they'll figure it out over time as they develop. I have clients this week that I started her, the woman, when she was pregnant when, with the twins, and we did a pregnancy consult. We did a breastfeeding consult. We did a toddler consult, and now we're doing a little kid consult. So I've been following them throughout the, I know, I like, I hope that I'm seeing them when they're seniors. <laughs> <laughs> But it's just so neat. I've had several consults with um, kids that, like you said, Dr. Clapper, that come to this, like I had, where I saw, I read John Robbins' Diet for New America, and I was like, wait, I don't want anything to do with animal eating animals, but I didn't know what to do. And it was scary. And my parents got worried about me when I cut out the animal products and we didn't know what I was doing. And I, I now is a very different time. That was pre-internet and there's so many resources available now. You know, that was pretty much why I wrote the Plant-Based Nutrition Idiot's Guide. The first book I wrote was because I wanted to have that guide. What do you do during pregnancy and infancy and childhood and all of that? Because there's information and there's plenty of information available so we could all do it. I would say the most important thing, like you all, I just kind of want to substantiate or corroborate what you all were saying. The most important thing is role modeling. If you are on the same page as your spouse or partner, whoever you're co-parenting with, that's the most important thing. And if that's the case, then that's how your house is. This is what we have. This is what we don't have. This is what's on the table. That's the meal. That's how they are. That's how they live. And it becomes their world. The most important thing, like you said, Dr. Clapper, all the research supports that if you are telling your child to eat their broccoli while you're sitting there eating your vegan ice cream, it's they're looking at what you're doing far more than they're listening. And um, that's children. I have two teenagers right now. That said, it's not like you can just force feed your children. It's very, 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 very tough socially. Okay, that said, they will learn, they will be inspired, and you can only be a lighthouse. That is all we can do. And, and provide the, the opportunities and provide the health promoting foods. So I've taught kids, I've taught every age group and I've gone into like kindergarten classes when my kids were in kindergarten. I would bring a big blender and I would let them make their own smoothies and make rainbows. I love rainbows always work, cutting things up it always works, wraps and pizzas, anything you could eat and enjoy, I could make plant-based, you can make plant-based, any of us can make plant-based. So things that your kids eat, getting them engaged, you know, 
um, gardening or taking them to the store or having them pick a recipe out and then they're committed like, Ooh, I want this one. Okay. How do we, what do we need to get? Let's go to the store together, like engaging them as much as you can so that they have some sort of vested interest in the process. They're more likely, the research shows they're more likely to eat those foods. Um, there's so many things. So dips, kids love dips. Hummus should be a food group. It always comes up. You can dip with vegetables. You could dip with crackers and whole grain, whole grain crackers. And uh, there's so many fun ways. I like to insert, I always call it nutrifying. So like my kids love, they survive on pasta really. It's <laughs> to my, whatever, that's a, that's a whole personal thing. But anyway, I will always infuse it with at least some vegetables. So every time I'm making them pasta, I will make sure there's greens in there. You know, you make, they have, there's this uh, pizza place around here that they have a kid sauce. So they sneak in the veggies in the marinara sauce. That's one way, but you also want to teach them to enjoy the actual process of eating those foods. So if you have, the ideal situation is that everyone in the home is on the same page. You start up at the beginning you, or whatever, you just do it together as a family and you have those options available. That's the ideal situation. So it's the, a lot of role modeling. Then there's other things you could do. There's like some fun books that are out there now and there are, you know, movies and stuff where they're talking about foods and they're looking at foods a different way. So just you know, look for things like that where you can get little glimpses of inspiration, some videos on YouTube, you know, with kids that are cooking, uh, just just whatever their likes and dislikes are, just get them towards eating the plants as much as you can in every way possible. Exposure and role modeling, those are the two most important things. Absolutely. Those are all fantastic. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so if you guys have any questions, please, um, if you're on Facebook on the Plant-Based Telehealth page, comment under this video with your question and we'll be happy to address that. And then if you're on the webinar, if you can just put it in the Q&A box. So we do have a few questions. Uh, before we go on, I just, uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, bravo on Juliet, uh, Juliana's uh, comments there. Um, to um, exhort everyone who does the shopping in your household to realize the power you have um, with the, uh, uh, if, if, if there's a bunch of candy bars and Skittles at home. It's hard to, to, to have your kids eat fruit. But if, those, but if the sugary junk never comes in the house, it isn't there. And realize the power you have as you are pushing that cart down the supermarket aisles. If you do not put that stuff in the basket, it just isn't an issue at home. And uh, put the good stuff in and come home. And if there's a, if there's a bowl full of, of cut up mango chunks and, and grapes and cherries and, and really delicious sweet fruits there. And the, uh, and the other stuff just isn't because we're talking about a healthy immune system. The last thing you want to do is eat a chunk of sugar um, for any reason, but certainly if you're fostering a healthy immune system in a child, the last thing you want to do is be bathing those lymphocytes, et cetera, with all this sucrose and fructose. It's not a good thing. So, um, so again, use your power. And uh, as you're shopping, mommy, why not? No, we, we don't bring that into our house. And, and of, you know, you're the boss. You're driving. You got the credit card. You got the driver's license. Uh, use your power. Uh, um, just put smart, good things in that bag. So, uh, an invitation to use your power. Oh. Yes, absolutely. Yes. How about invitation to parent? So, I'll just leave it at that. So, I know it's hard sometimes, guys, but you got to make the tough choices. Um, we're not here to be our kids' friends. We're here to be their parents. As they get older, you can become the friend. So, when you have less influence on, you know, you just gently give advice. <laughs> anyway, adulting, parenting adults, I found is is challenging, but it's a joy as well, but just different. <laughs> um, we do have a question. Uh, Hello, she has a one-year-old baby. How do I know if I'm overfeeding him? How do I know the daily portion? Thank you. Juliana, any thoughts there? Or I can give some thoughts to you. Yes, sure. I, I would say that that's why we have objective measures for that. We use the growth curve, the growth charts, and you just want to keep the, basically the goal is for your child to stay on its growth projectile. So you don't, if, if they're like 50 percentile at birth and all of a sudden they're 80 or 90 percentile at one of the checkups, that means you need to rein it in probably. Um, you also, I also, the other, uh, well, the other, I guess I would say subjective measure is how they are. Like if they're listless and maybe they're, you know, like watch their energy, you know, your child, you'll watch if they're getting sick more often, things like that, are warning signs that you need to address. Maybe not usually the portion, but usually the type of food. So I would say use objective measures. That's what the pediatric check-ins are for, especially when they're that little. Um, but you know, usually they are good about hunger satiety. It's us that ruin them. Like we get socialized into not listening to our instincts because naturally we're going to eat when we're hungry and stop when we're satisfied. But everything around us is kind of tailored us to 
avoid those cues or ignore those cues and push beyond them to points of where they are gaining. There's, obviously, that's the most the most um, dominant problem. It's more overnutrition, not undernutrition, but not so much in that age range. So let your baby navigate that. And unless there's a problem and he or she goes off the growth charts, and then you could address it then accordingly with, with knowledge and information and, and charting. It's really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's really important to understand that watch the growth curve because you don't want them falling off, but also you don't want to feed them junk food, right? So I have, I've had little ones come in for like a two-year-old check and they're chowing down on Cheetos and mom's drinking them some soda. <laughs> so, you know, these are things that we can avoid. If you don't introduce these foods um, at a young age, that's going to help you in the future when they, you start introducing other healthy foods. I mean, they're just going to take it. So um, some good friends of ours that we spent this last weekend with up in the mountains, they, they were, baby was conceived by plant-based parents, birth, you know, pregnancy, and now he's almost two. And I will tell you what, this kid, his favorite word to say is hummus. So he's not even two. He, <laughs> yes, I totally thought of you, Juliana. So he's like, every time he has it, he goes, hummus, hummus. <laughs> I'm like, what do you and think they don't know that the Right. And I never even tried hummus till I was over 40. So I think this is brilliant. So just think about all these amazing foods and flavors you can introduce, but absolutely, you know, just keep out the junk. You're in charge, like Dr. Clapper so eloquently said. So definitely. Um, there's a few different questions here. Um, what do you, this might just be with partners in general, not even if you have kids, but what do you advise parents to do when they have a partner on a board who insists on bringing junk into the household? So any thoughts there from any of you guys, just from a family member that's kind of sabotaging the whole thing? I have a personal experience. <laughs> okay, go for it. A deeply personal experience that I have to be careful how I say it. I did not have a partner on board and it was a disaster. It was a nightmare and it was really challenging. But I also, that said, I also work with clients and I have seen successful transitions. So it's really hard because the whole principle of food is this is like a free will world and everyone to each his own and you could lead a human to healthy but you can't make them eat. I have seen people come around and people getting on the same page. I give you all of my love and support because it is not easy. It is not easy and it's that when you care, it's your children. You care about your children more than anything in the world. Like they are your beings, like you made them and there's so much vested into them having the, you want the best for them. And it's, this is what I do for a living too. So it's been incredibly challenging for me with my children. The good news is for me, like my daughter came around. She like, want, she, there was reasons like socially where she's like, you know what, I'm going to eat this way. And she's really eating much healthier now, but um, it's very hard when there's a conflict in the house. So you can arm yourself with information and access to information. You can try to inspire the other partner. Um, you could try to control like what you, what, your production of food, like you can cook. I always cook. What I would do is I would make a lot of different options, which is, you know, you're doing that short order chef thing. I don't know if this is the best solution, honestly, but some it works for some people where you're the short order chef and you make several things um, so that someone at least will try some of the healthy stuff. Um, but again, the role modeling is everything. And I think that's what happened for my daughter. And I've seen that with other people that their kids, once they learn why it's so healthy or once they realize how good they feel or once they're interested in boys or girls uh, whatever like mm -hmm. if you know that when they get to the high school age which is um very motivating then they're going to want to get healthier and so if you're role modeling all you could do is control yourself that's the only thing you can fully control so if you're role modeling and you're not putting stuff in the cart and your other partner has to go and bring that stuff also which happens then you could only role model and provide the food and you could only do what you can do and be a lighthouse and not make it. I think what my lesson personally that I've, I've learned a lot of lessons. One of the biggest lessons I would share publicly is that um, don't try to force it. Don't make it a, such a big deal. Try to keep it um, gentle and open and loving and here's here's what I eat and I love this food and look how great I feel and look at my labs oh my goodness I'm still doing so great like the inspiration as opposed to shaming and guilting and make you don't want to cause this is such a crucial time childhood to cause issues about food I mean it's, this is socialization of food starts at home so many issues here so many issues you can only control yourself and what you put out to your children and so you do your best, right? We do. We all do our best. 
Absolutely. I, I would say agree, but Dr. Miller, Dr. Clapper, any other suggestions there? Yes. Uh, now, granted, I've uh, not had any children myself, so uh, this is uh, secondhand knowledge. But um, uh, one idea that uh, I ran into years ago that seemed that every time I mentioned it, the parents who do this have a really positive response in that um, they have, especially when a child uh, past age, in that age of two, three, four, five, where they're just getting into taste and textures, and uh, and a lot of them they they want to be like mommy or they want to be like daddy uh, the, and and imitate. Um, they have these uh, these little plastic devices for fifteen bucks, or these baby food grinders, baby food makers, and whatever mom and dad had for dinner, the lentil stew and or the bean uh, soup or whatever, uh, put it in the baby food grinder and watch the child have the child watch you make it, you know, and then and put it into bowls and spoon it back. Oh, it's mommy and daddy's food, and and they start tasting beans and legumes and sauces and things and starts educating their uh, their palate while not you don't have to worry about what it's doing to their intestinal tract or it's already uh, pretty much of a puree so um so often just uh, what, what do i feed my child whatever you had for dinner put it through the baby food grinder and give it to baby yeah or the child uh, yeah, by age three or four this works really well i'm told so uh, yeah. that's another way to get them in onto uh, the healthy food train there yeah absolutely that makes sense dr miller well, I don't have kids either, but I do try to surround myself by kids, my nieces and nephews and neighbors, and I just love them. And so I always want to try to encourage people to be eating healthy. So like Juliana, and I, my heart goes out to you with your own concerns, because it is so hard when we do nutrition ourselves to have issues within our own family. And I've had my own share of things. So I totally felt you when you were talking. So I, I know your kids are probably have learned and are beautiful now. So, um, but anyway, um, one thing, two, well, a couple tips that I like to share is one, two, I'm a fan of educating. Kids are smart, even like at five years old, like they start to learn and understand and they want to play a role. And they, if, again, if you make it fun, like everyone else has suggested a reason that they care about, they're going to want to choose that. They really, as, as they see you doing it and, and as, um, even if one person is still eating something, but now they understand that Papa ate spinach for his muscles. And so the kids, what kids are smart. I've seen them just kind of make the right choice. Not always, but you know, they kind of start to get it. And so when you're encouraging it and you're doing it and you make it easy for them, they will make that choice then oftentimes. Um, and giving a chance and keep and reinforcing it um, and asking your co-partner to um, make it a little easier, you know, not at least try to help the kid, you know, be, be encouraging, even if they're going to do their thing. So just maybe trying not to sabotage them. Maybe you could put their food higher up or in a different cupboard or kind of away from the kids so that just try to make it a little bit easier. Um, so the education is one, knowing that kids are smarter and then um, trying to hide it a little as, you know, trying to get everyone at least a little bit involved to make it easier for the kid is number two. And number three is what Juliana said, and I couldn't agree more. And it's the positive environment of our food to not make it negative, to not make it shame and blame, but to make it just, this is healthy food and this is what people eat all around the world. And this is what we're going to eat to nourish our bodies so that we grow into healthy, strong beings as well. And here are our choices for tonight's dinner and just make it kind of not a, uh, there's bad food and good food, or you're bad if you don't eat this, or you don't get dessert if you don't eat this, or shame or blame, or none of that. Just keep it a positive environment as best that you can what's in your control. So um, those are my little tips to share. Yeah, and I would honestly, um, with I was fortunate. My husband was very on board from day one with the crazy idea of going overnight. So I, I was lucky. The kids knew better than to harass me because I've always told them, what you have is what you, what you got <laughs> right in front of you. You'll be hungry the next meal. I mean, I went to medical school with three little kids, so I didn't have a whole lot of time to cook. And so it actually benefited us because they were never picky because they ate what they got. And like, it was like, well, we'll eat it because we're hungry. But one thing that just might be helpful is just re always open those lines of communication with your partner because it's so very important. You're constantly sharing, you know, maybe there's something that you feel better, like your cholesterol doll, like, you know, um, Juliana was saying her labs are better, or maybe that joint pain that you were suffering is gone, or your GI system is better, or maybe your child's eczema is cleared up, or maybe their asthma is better. You know, what parent doesn't want their child to be healthier? So I just would say these are the reasons we want to introduce healthier foods so they don't develop the chronic diseases maybe your partner's suffering from or what you're suffering from. So those are just some other things. And just think about, have them 
project into the future that these decisions that we're teaching our kids now have consequences. So it's not an, it's, it's, it's hard because each person has to face their own food addictions and different thoughts and beliefs and, but it's gentle reminders of why you're doing it and that may help and then make it just super easy to do. So if you can help them see how easy it is to transition to a healthier diet and they don't have to necessarily be fully on board, but say, can you just like bring that into the house? But maybe you eat it when you go out or when you go out with your friends um, at lunch at work, you know, just try to make some compromises and that, that will make it a little bit easier. So there's so much <laughs> you can talk about here. Um, here's another one. What is your experience when your kids go to a friend's house, uh -huh, our birthday party where it's pepperoni pizza and ice cream? My take is you choose your battles and continue to educate. Yes. So one of the things that I feel like we did very well with three teenagers is in the house, this is what you got. But when you go out, you do what you want. And over time, what happened, I'd say over a year or so, I really started noticing my two youngest, especially my daughter went off to college and she did what she did and she's come back around. But the, the two boys over the course of a year or so, when we would go out, they would order tofu instead of the chicken. Um, we were never big on the soda, so that wasn't a big issue, but that was it. And then there was an incident with Gabriel, my little one. Um, well, he wasn't so little, he's a teenager who did go somewhere and became very ill. Um, actually ended up in the hospital <laughs> with severe abdominal pain, elevated white count, because he chose to eat the pepperoni pizza, double cheeseburger, and some ice cream, which he didn't eat at home. And um, let's just say it was quite an experience and he learned very quickly. And now even, I think even a month ago, he said he had ordered a plant-based shake at a, a restaurant in, at a school where he's in college. And he goes, mom, I knew immediately there was dairy in it because I started cramping. It's like, I can't eat, I can't take this. So, you know, those things remind them. So they'll also not feel good afterwards. They'll feel tired, their tummy not feel well. They'll start putting those two things, two and two together. So um, hope that's helpful. But any other situations or ideas, thoughts there for everyone? I was asked that exact question today. So it's tough for me because again, I don't have kids. So it's really hard for me to give that answer. But um, as for, you know, for people that if we're trying to reverse a chronic illness in a kiddo, um, and then that one meal or that one treat, as we call it, we call it treats, but it makes me so sad that for us to treat our kids, our families, you know, at a birthday party, we give our loved ones foods that are causing the inflammation and the diseases in them in the first place. And, and so many of the parents are facing diseases that the kids now have the genes for, right? So even if the kids don't yet have it. And so, you know, I'm always like, we'll try to have your smoothie in the morning, do your best, you know, maybe you can bring healthy treats, you can make, there's so many healthy ideas now, like over forks over knives, or healthy human revolution, or some of Juliana's cookbooks, or there's so many ideas that people can make a healthy treat and share it with others. And because, uh, you know, that sugar, that inflammation, that processed food, that dairy products, all those animal products, I mean, that's a big hit on someone whose immune system or someone who's trying to reverse a chronic illness or, you know, even little kiddo who's trying to be healthier, trying to make good choices. So, and then it also resets taste buds sometimes, you know, it can be hard if, if, uh, if someone has sugar addictions or food addictions, and then we're working so hard to develop new taste buds and get used to like simple food from nature as the world intended it. And now all of a sudden we're eating back to the process a little bit. So it can be challenging. So um, I don't really have an answer though. I just always encourage to do the best and to support and to give healthy options so that hopefully we'll minimize those opportunities and that as kids get older, that they'll choose that less because it's possible they'll feel bad. Like, Dr. Marbus was saying, and, and they'll have repercussions from those choices. So to minimize that by not letting that happen as much, but yes, I question. and I was curious what everybody was going to say with that as well, because I didn't know what else to answer that. So uh, yeah, I agree. Yeah. The, uh, for, for those parents who both happen to be ethical vegans and are raising their child with, with that uh, uh, mindset, um, there's going to come that day, most, most likely, when the child's going to come back and yeah, there, was, there was chicken at the party and I, and I, and I ate some. Um, and then, well, now that moment has come. So now what do you do with that? And uh, as your world shattered, uh, there's, a, um, there's a great learning opportunity there. Sit the child down and, and ask, yeah, so what do you think? And what do you feel? What is it? How did it taste? What do you think about it now? Uh, 
uh, did you consider the the animal? Is it the animal? Just ask. Uh, see what the child has to tell you. And uh, it's an opportunity for open dialogue on a very very important topic, rather than uh, you betrayed me or how could you do that or or make the child feel uh, like they did something wrong. They did that as everyone's been saying here. That when they're out, they're going to do what they're going to do. They're individual you know, kids. They're individual people and. Child is, is about individuation. It's about becoming your own person. And there comes that moment, you gotta decide what it is you're putting in your mouth. And so be an ally to your child uh, during this very, very formative time. This is a delicate moment, but she could be handled very well. I think that's a great point because not only you're increasing the communication with your child, but you're giving them critical thinking skills. So you're looking at what the child's deciding and there will be consequences. So you know, like you said, talk about the animal or you're thinking about, well, now how do you feel? Do you feel more tired? Is your tummy upset? So they just really understand that what I do now may have future consequences. And I think that's something that a lot of us are missing in opportunities to teach our kiddos that those long, it's just like, you know, teaching your children financial readiness. You just got to teach them nutritional readiness as well. Because when they do go off to college, it's a whole other ballgame. <laughs> so, but any, any other thoughts on that one? I love that. I love what you just said, nutrition readiness. Yes. It's, it's so interesting. It is so interesting. All of it is, so, there's so much to say. I just had an idea and I lost it. I mean, well, you're I'm so glad that happens to other people, especially <laughs> the young, younger ones. It's wonderful. I'm so glad, Juliana. Thank you. That's the best gift I've had today. <laughs> oh, goodness. There's just so many, there's so many things to think about. I mean, I did things for my kids. I brought them to farm sanctuaries and I brought them to, you know, I, would, I, would, I didn't show them any of the footage because I'm an ethical vegan too. That's how it started for me separately. But um, I tried to introduce them to those concepts in a very beautiful way, not the horrible imagery that I, that are very, it's very graphic. I didn't show them any of that. Um, I used just, it's again, I try to be very positive and inspiring and, you know, I, they saw me do videos with, you know, on farms, loving animals and doing cooking videos. I did a cooking video with my daughter for meatless, uh, meat, um, kids cook Mondays. And we, we did a little bit, in fact, it was 10 years ago this last month, I was going to post it again because she's, she went from this tiny little adorable thing to like, Aww. she's me now. But um, so I was, I, my mistake, and what I tell my clients that are parents now, was that I really was on a mission. This was really important to me. This was a priority to me to have my kids eat healthy. Like I thought, well, I know what I'm doing and I'm just going to make it happen. No, it didn't work like that. And so I was like a real, I, I was conf I would have arguments with other, like at sporting things, like when my son would have a game or a practice and they would hand him the junk food. I was the mom that would like take the junk food away. Or I was the mom that said, no, we don't need that. Or we're gonna go have something else. Or I have this. Or, I tried every strategy to be honest. And it was, I didn't have a partner on board. So it was like, then the dad gives him his stuff and it's like, so then what was the point of what mommy said, right? So there's that. If you're on the same page, it's much easier in social environments because you can prepare, you can have colleagues and friends and engagements, family engagements, where you always have the food that's available. That's just how we eat. This is how our family eats. Or you could eat ahead of time. You could um, plan it, just planning and knowing, but everyone being on the same page is the best thing. But again, free will dimension. This is where we all have to decide for ourselves. And the only thing you can fully control is what you do and what you role model. So that's where yeah. I'm... That's where I'm at right now, personally, and with what I tell people is that you could only make those choices for yourself. I have to say that that is absolutely true. So, for example, we lived in a small town in western Colorado called Rifle. All right, y'all figure it out. Rifle. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be a lot of ranchers, hunters, that type of thing. So, first of all, you could learn real quick who's the vegan kids, right? So, my youngest, Gabe, actually took it on and loved it. He loved being the only vegan kid. He would make... He made a documentary for one of his classes all about like a kale burrito and made it was really funny. Um, Gabe played baseball since on the, you know, the uh, varsity team since his freshman year. This kid could catch an entire seven inning game. High school games, there are seven innings. And then the, if there's a double header, because you have little small towns, you don't travel back and forth. You do double header in one evening. And then he'd pitch and he, he was never sore. The other kids are falling apart because like, how does your kid do that? I was like, well, look what he's eating. So what do you think happens between with the recovery and all those different things? You're doing cross country and, you know, do these things and he's not hurting. He's not, 
we're, we're, we're totally doing the beet powders, the beet juice. We are, <laughs> we are doing all the research and saying, hey, Gabe, let's, let's really jack up your athletic performance by doing whatever we can. And the kids really respond to that because they just want to be the best they can be. They want to feel good. They want to, you know, stand out in a positive direction. And so I think that was really cool. And, you know, there was a period of time where we had quite a few of the baseball parents trying plant-based diet and some of the kids. So these are some things just sharing your positive experience will also help with that. So, and then when it's our turn to bring the snacks, what do you think I'm bringing? I'm bringing some really yummy food, not just your orange slices. I'm like, we're bringing some good stuff because I want them curious about it. So use those as opportunities to share what you're doing. So um, yeah, I love that. So just, <laughs> we should probably go to the next question. My daughter has a cough, fear, and asthma, usually brought on by seasonal allergies. I've heard diversity of microbiota can play a big role in allergies. Any truth to this, what can I do to help her? Any of you? Um, I, I can jump into a little bit of, about that. So um, great, you're right on track with diversity of microbiome and building a healthy immune system. And there is actually good data now that um, in countries where people eat less than five servings of fruit and vegetables a day, they had significantly more asthma and allergies. And in countries where they ate over seven or eight servings, it significantly went down. So number one is just increasing the amount of fruits and vegetables. And again, I think that should be raw. Um, as much as possible. Again, with kids, maybe you can't, maybe that's not ach achievable and then that's okay. You just do the best that you can. But if you can push towards seven, eight servings of raw, fresh fruits and vegetables for, like Dr. Clapper had said earlier, the microbiome that's actually on that produce, the living foods in it, the vitamin C, again, that I keep going back to, but it's destroyed when we cook it. And so um, doing our best to get the fresh produce um, and then diversity. So if they'll eat the beans for you, if they'll eat the whole grains for you, um, mixing it up and getting um, a different array of, for the microbiome for them is going to be really important. Um, certain fruits and vegetables have more of what's called quercetin, which is a phytonutrient that um, is known to be antihistamine. So high quercetin foods include the skins of apples. So if you can get organic apples and eat the skins, that's wonderful. Onions are high in quercetin. Um, and then just colorful fruits and vegetables. Again, I go back to with that as well. So um, eating foods like that will be very helpful. Um, with allergies, it's tricky because then you also want to look for triggers. So if it's, um, if there's, you know, trying to vacuum and dust a little more, and that's hard for me because I always forget to do that as well. But, um, you know, getting rid of dust mites and keeping the house kind of clean and, and um, trying to figure out if there's any exposures in the house. But number one really is getting the immune system healthier. So prebiotic fiber, resistant starch, eating um, fresh fruits and vegetables, the legumes, the whole grains, things like that are really, really key. Um, sometimes I will use a probiotic in certain people. Um, there's more evidence now that probiotics are not always helpful. So I'm picking and choosing only certain probiotics now and in certain patients for certain reasons. Um, but then I do find it can, that can be helpful as well, especially if um, the person has been on antibiotics or maybe wasn't breastfed as much or it has different past medical history or something going on, then I may want to use that to help the microbiome as well. But in general, it's really ramping it up. And um, I think it sounds like you're on track, whoever asked that question, because you're asking the right questions. Oh, one last thing that we haven't really touched on, but it's um, getting omega-3 fatty acids into the diet. So um, things like flax seeds, chia seeds, walnuts, those leafy green vegetables, that's all going to be really important. And sometimes a little extra algae oil, um, getting a little extra EPA and DHA for the anti-inflammatory factors of that will be helpful for immune systems that are kind of overreactive like to allergies. So those are some of my tips. That's excellent. Uh, okay. Those are all excellent points. Um, only thing I would add is that often the food sphere and the seasonal allergies often overlap in that um, I've had patients who adopted a really clean plant-based diet and they noticed that they don't, their, a lot of their seasonal allergies went away. And what I suspect is that people, especially who aren't completely plant-based or who are still eating dairy products, et cetera, um, they've got a low-grade uh, dairy allergy, low-grade wheat allergy. Sometimes they're reacting to something in their diet. And as the reactive molecules, the casein or the gluten or whatever it might be they're eating, uh, <clears throat> flows through their nasal membranes, ooh, that sets off a, uh, 
um, a, a low, it starts inching things down on the allergic response and the, uh, the uh, capillaries get a little leaky and the histamine uh, builds up and the mast cells get a little plump uh, and, uh, and the membranes get primed that when that little old pollen grain lands on these already primed membranes, whoa, out comes the mucus and the sneezing and the congested eyes, et cetera. But, but the stage was set from the, what the person was eating. Uh, it wasn't all that bad old pollen uh, was a problem. A lot has to do uh, with what we did to our membranes to uh, set up that kind of reaction. So um, certainly if there's anyone listening here who has uh, seasonal allergies and you are a dairy eater, try the big experiment for a few months, mix on the milk and cheese and ice cream and yogurt and read the labels on the bread, et cetera. There's often dairy uh, casein and whey and, and lots of, lots of uh, baked goods, et cetera. Uh, and um, and if, you're, if you find yourself, your hay fever is not so bad this year, uh, it may well be because your, your gut is healthier and your, your membranes aren't so primed to have these reactions there. So, uh, the, so the, the, the pollen might be uh, your body giving you a message on, on the underlying uh, reactivity of your diet there. So lean and clean is the way to go here. Everything benefits. Absolutely, definitely. Um, there is uh, another quick question, I think, here, because smoothies, I, we kind of started off with smoothies. That was a really cool way for us to get this, but what are your thoughts on green smoothies? What about chia and flaxseed? Juliana? I've had, <laughs> this has come up so much. I have a video on it. You can Google my uh, to smoothie or not to smoothie. It's called to smoothie or not to smoothie. That is the question. Uh, I also love Shakespeare. So anyway, um, I started with green smoothies. I was one of those first green smoothie videos that like way back when those little YouTube things were starting, that was my very first video was a green smoothie. And I did a lot of green smoothie videos and on TV, I've done a lot of green smoothies on TV. And I love them because, oh my gosh, it's the most nutritional bang for your caloric buck. You get this delicious, nutritious, you know, beverage of choice with everything. You get every color of the rainbow in there with your seeds, whatever. You can put everything, you can get anything into a smoothie. And I love that because I think it's a great gateway food because not everyone wants to eat, I can't imagine, but not everyone wants to eat tons of leafy greens every day, raw and cooked and salads and all that. I mean, I don't know, I think these people exist, but if you don't, that is a good gateway to start getting them in because a lot of people start with a really super sweet palate and a smoothie is a way to make green super sweet and you don't even kind of taste them going down. You can use frozen vegetables, frozen greens, frozen broccoli, and you may not even notice they're there. I don't know why you'd want to miss the deliciousness of those greens, that's my favorite thing. But they can be, they can fit into a healthy diet. That said, a lot of people come to me to lose weight. A lot of people come to me to improve a lot of different things. And you lose the benefit of having to digest those foods when you puree it because it's all done in the blender. So is that a bad thing? Is that a good thing? It just depends. Like, are you okay on your weight? And, and that's not an issue. Do you need more calories in? We've talked about gaining weight several times. I have a video on that too, about gaining weight healthfully. Um, it's the, the question is, what's the goal? Are you one that will just do like what I do and can't get enough greens in my diet that I want to chew them all day? Like it's my favorite food. Uh, then that's great. Then you don't need to do a smoothie. So there's nothing there, but then there's all these people that have digestive issues or health, you know, absorption issues. And then this is a great solution because you can get more in there. It's already pre-digested for you. So it will go through your GI tract. And um, there's a lot, there's a lot here. It's, it's a real loaded question in terms <laughs> of what the right answer is. And I think it depends on the situation and they could definitely fit into a health promoting diet. Yeah, absolutely. And so we certainly have used them and drink them slowly. You don't want to gulp them down because your body is not, you know, it'd be like taking the entire salad and stuffing it in your, in your tummy all at once, but slowly over a half hour to an hour is, you know, small drinks. <laughs> um, one last question is I know Dr. K, you got to go to another meeting, um, but uh, Philip asked, both me and my partner now have very high blood pressure, never had it until we went vegan January 1st, 2020. Can you advise the best way to reduce blood pressure? We've tried plant sterols, but to no use, doctor wants us both on meds. I'm just going to say there are many things that I worry about when people say vegan um, versus a whole food plant-based diet eating processed foods, ton of sodium, and some other things. So just because it says vegan and comes out of the store does not make it healthy. And honestly, Philip, I think you would do well to see one of us on plant-based telehealth because we could definitely help with that. Um, and there's lots of things to deal with blood pressure. So 
that would be my suggestion, plantbasedhealth.com. But any other suggestions on, certainly there are foods that we could be eating um, and some other stuff. Anybody? Low pressure? Uh, processed foods are usually playing the culprit role there. Um, There's so many things in them, the oils, <clears throat> the sugars, the sodium, uh, the, the gluten, uh, it's, uh, it's notorious. If you really, uh, the, your best friend, again, are Dr. Marvis's dark leafy greens and Juliana's dark leafy greens because they're full of potassium and magnesium and they open up blood vessels and then it helps lower <clears throat> plants, lower blood pressure. So I uh, have a big salad every day and just load for a few weeks, go really heavy on, on the green and yellow vegetables, soups and salads and steamed veggies. And, uh, and you might even consider a three-day water fast or five-day water water fast once a month uh, also helps to lower it down. So there are ways to do that. Again, like Dr. Marvin said, may, uh, arrange a, a consultation with one of us, plant-based telehealth here, and we can, we can coach you on, on how to help uh, get this down naturally. Absolutely. So any final thoughts before we uh, sign off for the day? Um, I would just say good luck to all the kids starting school and all the parents. I know there's a lot of fear out there and um, this is a tough time and it's a tough decision. All my friends and my brothers um, are going through this right now as well. So um, good luck to you all and um, just do the best you can to get a healthy immune system and positive vibes and sunshine and, and um, rest and take care of yourselves and nourishing lifestyle. It all matters and um, you'll do well. So good luck, everyone. Yeah, what she said. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. And just don't forget to take care of yourselves because you're taking care of everybody else. So take care of yourselves too. So that's really important. But yeah, all absolutely. right, guys. Eat more veggies. All right. Eat more veggies. It's the food, as Dr. Claproy says. It's the food. It's, it's the, the food. food. I was telling my patient about you this morning. It's the food. There it is. Yay. <laughs> it's the best. <laughs> Legendary. All right, all right. All right. Bye, everyone. Have Bye. a great week. <laughs> Bye. Thank <laughs> you.